Well, I just have a few announcements uh, this morning. Um, somebody said, and I don't remember who said it, but they said that every great revival starts with prayer. And uh, we have a couple opportunities um, to get together uh, next week and just pray. And uh, I don't want to neglect the importance of prayer. It's, it's a really valuable thing and praying uh, for our community especially. So, um, so we got the National Day of Prayer on Thursday uh, where we pray for our nation. And then um, next Sunday night uh, at 6, uh, we're going to get together here with other churches in the community and pray for our city and our nation. And that's just a really valuable thing. I really encourage you guys to, to come to that. Um, there's info in your, in your bulletin. Um, also, uh, we have the uh, Young Life garage sale coming up. We're trying to support Young Life. If you have items you'd like to donate, um, it's this Saturday. So bring them in uh, to the office, uh, just this building over here, before Saturday. So that'd be great if you can support Young Life in that. Um, also, there are uh, lavender sheets. They're not in your bulletins, um, but they are in the back in the info center. Um, they're for the uh, MCC relief kits. They go out all around the world. Um, you guys have gotten them in previous bulletins, but uh, just remember that they're due this week, I think. If you have questions or you want to know who to contact, you can talk to Caroline Shower or uh, Becky Unger. So um, be sure to do that. If you're new also, uh, we have connection cards in the seat pockets uh, in front of you. Um, be sure to fill that out and hand that in to an usher. That would just give us a way to be in contact with you during the week, so that'd be great. Uh, as we transition, we recently had a team go down to Arizona um, on mission for God. They, uh, they were involved in building projects on a reservation down there, and uh, we want to hear their story, so I'm going to ask Bill and the group that went down to Arizona to come on up and uh, tell us a little bit about what happened and um, how God used the, uh, used the time, so we're going to ask them to come up. <laughs> Thank you, Tyler. Don't everybody come up all at once too quickly. Uh, come on up. We talked in the discovery class. <laughs> uh, we're excited for what you guys have to share with us. Uh, we prayed for you to go out and for God to prepare the way um, as part of what we do here at Good News. We gather together not so we can feel good about ourselves or even comfortable, but so that we can go out uh, into our neighborhoods, into Whatcom County, uh, even around the, uh, our whole nation to do God's work. And so we want to hear uh, from you guys, and I'm just going to hold this out, and the spokesperson can, can just take it, whoever that might be. All right, hands. <laughs> I think I got elected somehow. Uh, we, I think I can speak for everyone that... Uh, we were all blessed when we were down there um, in special ways, and uh, uh, hopefully the folks down there were blessed as well by us coming. I think in a, in a way it's uh, kind of similar to when Caroline and I went to Africa. Uh, people there are so um, glad that you come, especially if you've come such a long distance. And it is kind of a long distance from here down to Arizona. So um, during, part of the, during part of the bus ministry, the uh, the leader there held up a map and showed that uh, where we came from, Washington State, and the kids were kind of impressed that it was we'd come that far. So that was a neat thing to see. Um, two things that I kind of wanted to share. Uh, the first one was uh, the first day we were down there on uh, Monday morning. We drove around the reservation in a van and prayed in the different neighborhoods or needs that they had to kind of give us an idea of the reservation and some of the problems they have down there. And I was able to pray in one area for specifically for, there's a gang problem in some areas of the reservation. And so I prayed for uh, a couple to come forward from the, from the uh, reservation themselves to work with the youth there in that neighborhood. That was a real need that they had. So I would ask you all to keep that in, in your prayers as well. They need, they would really like people from the reservation to come forward and help in the different neighborhoods 
um, kind of fight against the, the spirit of uh, Satan that is there in a lot of places in alcohol, drugs, and, and gang activity. So keep that in mind. And the second thing that uh, really struck me was in the the bus ministry. In the afternoons, we went out to neighborhoods and picked up kids from different areas, and then we stopped at a uh, playground and played games and did various activities with them. But a couple of the kids during the week actually remembered me from last year, which I found just amazing because we'd only been with them for maybe a couple hours during that one day last year. And it just pointed out to me how important this bus ministry is to those kids. They really look forward to it. And for a lot of them, I think it's the high point of their whole week to come and spend time with other kids and hear about the Lord and have fun together. And uh, so to me, that was, uh, that was worth the whole trip. I'm not sure if anybody else would want, want to share, but... Uh, well... Uh, a year ago, Sharon had mentioned she would like to go, so as the kids were moving out of the house, we were trying to reconnect in something, so I thought I'd go along. <laughs> <laughs> and so um, it was a real learning experience for me. As most people know, I'm a doer, and my work, yeah, I get pushed pretty hard, and I try and come through with the deadlines. So it was a real learning experience for me to back off and remember to take it easy. Because this is a whole different culture of where they do take it easy. And I don't think deadlines are really met. I think it is a real miracle if they do, because this house that we worked on was supposed to be done last month, at the beginning of last month, and we're in April already, so. Uh, but that's the way it goes. And we found out things aren't always square, so you got to improvise as well. <laughs> so that was a challenge. But, uh, and in a way, I, they have to be very flexible. Mac, uh, who's the leader, he never knows who he's going to get and what kind of workers they're going to be. So it's not only us being flexible, but they have to be flexible as well. well thank you for uh, following the leading of the Holy, Holy Spirit and getting a little uncomfortable uh, and, and doing God's work. And it's encouraging to hear uh, that the kids remember and that the lives are touched uh, there. And I know, I know your heart is for God's work in Whatcom County and around the world. So thank you for encouraging us to, to do the same, to listen to God and to get uncomfortable. And, and well said, Jack, uh, life isn't square sometimes. We have, we have to rely on God to improvise. That, that's very well said. That's going to show up again. I like it. Uh, let, me, let me praise the Lord for what he's done and how he's answered our prayers. And uh, again, thank you for encouraging us in this. God, uh, we, we thank you for what you've done. We thank you for how you've been at work. In Arizona, we pray for the, the lives to be touched by the efforts of these servants that have shared with us, God. Pray that their work would extend past the time that they were there. God, we pray that you would prepare the way for next year. God, prepare the way in the hearts of our friends and our neighbors as well as we launch out as a group of missionaries to do your work in Milwaukee County. All God's people said together, Amen. Thank you, guys. Thanks for sharing. Part of the mentality I've mentioned before is that we gather here together as a church body, not as a social club, but to scatter out into Whatcom County. We have this, uh, this logo. I don't know if we have it uh, loaded up or not. There we go. Uh, that we gather together. You'll see this a lot. We gather together as God's people called out from our community to go out into our community. Uh, if... If all you're doing is coming here on Sunday morning and you've been doing that for a while, I have to tell you, you're missing out on opportunities to get to know your friends and your neighbors, even to get to know other people here at Good News in the faith community. So I want to, I want to encourage us all to both gather and to scatter doing God's work. Would you do me a favor? Would you think over the next week, uh, an answer to this question, we're going to pose it formally with some cards next week, but 
If you could ask God one question, what would it be? If you could fill in the blank, uh, what does the Bible say about dot, dot, dot? If you could fill that sentence in. I want, I want to encourage you to be thinking throughout this week, if you could ask God one question. We're going to launch into a series in the summer where we're, we're going to address the questions that we have as a church body. We're going to go to God's Word and see what God has to say. So uh, everything's, anything's fair game, anything and everything. Just write down what you'd like to learn about. Sound good? Great. Uh, the, if we want to dismiss the kids, we'll, we'll show that sign. We'll dismiss the kids for Children's Church. Kiddos, have a great time in Children's Church. If you're looking for an opportunity to serve, hi, sweet girl. Hey. Have a good time. If you're looking for an opportunity to serve, we, uh, we always need uh, volunteers to serve in children's ministry, and it touches lives. We're running about 45, 50 kids back there, so uh, pray for our teachers as well. This nice weather recently reminded me of a, a trip that I took on the north side of Lake Chelan. I was dropped off by a boat, and I was going to hike quite a distance up to the northern part of the lake. And I started, as all trips start, as all journeys begin, I started out feeling like I had a ton of energy. My pack for the week weighed absolutely nothing, it felt, on my back. And I had a spring in my step as I marched down the trail on the beautiful north end of Lake Chelan. And the birds were chirping and flies were flying all around. And then after the first day, I realized I didn't have quite as much spring as in my step. I didn't even have enough energy to pitch my tent, so I just throw, threw my mat on the ground and passed out. And the next day in the journey, I woke up and I put on my shoes, and the first couple of steps were excruciating because I had already developed blisters. And every step that whole week was a lesson in pain and suffering. I remember going up hills and then going down hills that I would get to the top and I think I just couldn't make it. My legs felt so weak, they felt like limp noodles. And then on the way down, my knees felt like jackhammers were hammering against them. And those flies that were once flying around started biting me. I developed an ache in my side from sleeping on the ground, which I later realized was a tick that had buried its way into my side. And the backpack strap had rubbed against that tick for a week. What started out as a really good journey quickly turned into moments of weakness and pain. And there were times in that journey where I would take off the pack and I would sit down on a rock and I just wouldn't want to go on. And then I would throw the pack back on and buckle up and start to hike again, still feeling weak and worn and weary. I think a lot of times our spiritual lives are like that, that we start out fresh and excited at what could be in store, but over the years, and as we go along the journey, do you ever feel weak, worn? Do you ever feel pain, like life is just rubbing against you and it's rubbing you raw? We have this ideal of where we want to be in God, of where God wants us to be, and then we take an honest assessment of where we are and we realize that we are weak. We try and focus on God, maybe even reading our Bible more and praying more, but one thing after another happens to us. We're deceived. We're thrown into despair. We're discouraged. And so we give up that regular habit of reading the Bible and praying, and we wait for next year's New Year's resolution to motivate us again. We hear of new believers coming to faith in Jesus Christ, and we may even feel motivated to share our faith, and then all of a sudden we're assaulted with reminders of our own inadequacy. 
discouragement that there's no way we could possibly be used by God. Or we're distracted by our unimportant schedules of busyness and noise. And after feeling bombarded by the fear of rejection and failure, we feel so weak that we just put God's work on hold and say, God, I can't do that right now. We want to dwell on God. We want to think of God. We want to passionately pursue God. But our thoughts are bombarded by greed, despair, lust, pride, we focus on meaningless things that steal our time and energy. Sometimes we feel so weak, beat down by life, that we don't do anything. The times that we mess up, we say, God, I'll never do that again. Yet, we fall into the same sin again and again and we and again. Feeling like we don't have the strength to say no to temptation. And when we do mess up, we feel unforgivable, crushed by guilt. And even though we pray to God to forgive us, there are times in our weakness where we feel unforgivable. Walking with God daily is tough. Amen? I mean, walking with God, the daily walk, the daily journey with God is tough. We're going to talk today about how we walk when we feel weak. Walking when we feel weak. We're going to talk about the reason that we feel weak in our walk. And then we're going to start talking about how we walk when we're weak. This week and next week are two messages talking about almost the exact same thing, walking when we're weak. So if you miss next week's message, be sure and listen to it online. It's important for where we are at as a church. All right, Because the reason that we feel weak isn't because we're too busy. The reason that we feel weak isn't because we're too old or too young or too tired, or we don't have enough resources, or we don't have enough time. Those may all be true, but the core reason that we are weak, the core reason that is difficult to walk daily with God, is that we are in a war zone. Sometimes when life is great, and fire isn't going on all around us, bombs aren't exploding at our doorstep, we forget that we are at war. I'm not talking about physical war. I'm talking about spiritual battlefield. We are in a spiritual war zone. Amen? And it's something we don't talk about. It's something we don't even pray about that often. It's something that if we don't understand the reason that we're tired isn't because we need more time or we need more efforts or we need to try harder. The core reason of why we are weak, why we feel weak, is because we are at war. We are in a war zone right now. Every time God moves, Satan counter moves. Every time God is up to something good, Satan is not happy and it's a counter move. God moved when he created the world. Satan counter moved when he tempted and deceived Adam and Eve to disobeying God. And since the very beginning of the Bible, the very, very beginning of God's Word, we're told that there is a battle going on between good and evil. Read with me in Genesis 3. It says, I will put enmity between you and the woman, talking to the snake, and between your offspring and her offspring. He shall bruise your head and you shall bruise his heel. We are at war. Every time God moves, Satan counters. God moved when he created the world, and Satan countered by deceiving Adam and Eve. God moved 
through Abraham, saying, I'm going to create a ton of people through you, Abraham. And Satan countered and trapped God's people in Egypt in slavery. And then God moved in Mo- through Moses, delivering those people out of Egypt. And the whole Bible, this, this whole book is a story of God moves and then Satan counter moves and God moves and Satan counter moves. Every time God is on the move, Satan is not happy and will counter move. And God is on the move here at Good News. God is on the move here at Good News, and I am ecstatic about that. I'm so thrilled to, oh, God, thank you that you are on the move. But we need to remember, every time God moves, Satan counter moves. We have prayed for missionaries to go out to Argentina and Arizona, and we've heard great reports. God is on the move. I think of Dan, who we baptized at Easter, who stood up here and said, God is so awesome. God is on the move. I think of new believers that have decided to follow Jesus Christ recently who have a newfound hope and a newfound life. And I'm reminded that God is on the move. Those 45 or 50 kids that leave to children's church, that sing songs about God, that have their hearts oriented to God, through children's ministry reminds me that God is on the move. God is on the move when I hear stories of, I heard a story recently of one of our church members, a retired gentleman who has pinpointed his mission field and is building intentionally relationships, he's building relationships intentionally with this group of guys so that he can share God's truth with them and speak light into their lives. God is on the move. God is on the move in life groups. In our discovery class today, folks shared with tears in their eyes how they felt touched by the connection that they felt with other believers. God is on the move. And God has great work work for us to do in the future as well. And God will be on the move in the future. Pastor Tyler and I talk about new life groups that are forming this fall being strategic in in getting our whole church body involved intergenerationally in life groups. And I see that, and my prayer is that God would be mightily on the move. We've been praying about serious matters, and we've seen God answer prayer, and we are reminded that God is on the move, but everywhere God is on the move, Satan counter moves. Maybe today you don't feel that excited or you don't really feel like God is on the move. Maybe you come here today discouraged. Maybe your life has been thrown into despair. Maybe you're wrestling with a critical spirit. And I want to call that out. And say that God is mightily at move. Mightily on the move. So watch out for how Satan counter moves. Satan is always at work. And we see throughout the whole Bible, we read in Genesis, the the very first part of the Bible here, that God and Satan are move, counter move, move, counter move. But we know as Christians, we know how it ends, right? We know who wins. Amen? Amen? Kind of a weak amen if you really know how it ends. We know how it ends, amen? Let me just remind you, I've been studying the book of Revelation. We're going to go through the whole book of Revelation uh, in the fall. So I've been studying the book of Revelation, and I came across this passage that was such an exciting reminder for how God has made a final move, right? God has made a final move through his son, Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior, who died conquering death, beating sin, so that we can live for him today. Amen? Revelation chapter 20. So what's happening in the book of Revelation is Satan has been released after being bound. Satan's been released, and he's gathering up this huge army, right? The numbers, like the the sands of the sea. 
the sands of the seashore. And there's just a ton. There's this huge battle escalating. And the battle builds and builds and builds. <laughs> then we get to Revelation 20. And they marched up over the broad plain of the earth and surrounded the camp of the saints. This is Satan and his crew and the beloved city. So here it is. There's about to be this huge battle. Who's going to win? Satan's final counter move. And all of a sudden, fire came down from heaven and consumed them. <sighs> Done. And the devil who had deceived them was thrown into the lake of fire and sulfur where the beast and the false prophet were. And they will be tormented day and night forever and ever. God's final move. So no matter what we are going through, we know we are in a war zone, but we know how things end. Amen? We know that God has the last move. That He is all-powerful. Amen? But, sometimes it doesn't feel that way. Right now, we are still in the battle. We are not in Revelation 20 right now. We are right in the middle of the battle and we feel weak. Ephesians 6, starting with verse 10, talks to us about how we walk when we are weak. Right when we're in the middle of this battle, right in the very center of the war. When we're weak and we feel like we can't go on. Even though we know what happens in the end. We're told in Revelation 6, and if there's one thing you can remember today, it's this. Stand strong. If you feel weak today, if you come here discouraged with a critical spirit, when, if you feel down, if you feel beat down and weak in your walk, stand strong. Stand strong in the Lord. When we're faced with a battle, a lot of times uh, we think that we can do it on our own. We say, <laughs> oh, I, I can do it. When somebody asks for prayer requests in group and something comes to your mind that you need help with, you think, no, nah, it's, it's not that big of a deal. I, I can handle this. I don't need to bring it before the whole group. All I have to do is work a little bit harder. I can say no the next time I'm tempted. We see that is the very thing that Satan wants you to believe. That you can do it on your own. Evil is never. Uh, evil is never in tight. Uh, evil is never uh, discouraging. We don't look at evil and say, "Yeah, I don't want to do that." No, it's always very appealing, very enticing to want to do things on our own. Read with me, uh, verse ten, Ephesians six, verse ten. Finally, be strong in the Lord and in the strength of His might. That be strong, that verb is passive. It's uh, to be strengthened by God. It's not something you do within yourself. It's something outside of you coming alongside and strengthening you up. It's a passive form of the verb. It says, you, Christian, be strengthened by God. Draw on something outside of yourself for your source of strength. We're told to be strong in the, uh, be strong in the Lord and in the might of his strength. God is strong. Amen? I mean, God is strong. He is mighty. He is powerful. I mean, God just said, hey, mountains. These mountains just rose in creation. He said, hey, animals. All these animals were created. The smartest people in the world with the most money can't do a fraction of what God can do when he just speaks. God is powerful. We've heard stories of marriages that are on the rocks when counselors give up on marriages and God comes in and reorients hearts and reforms minds to keep couples together stronger than ever. He is powerful. 
when we look at our own sinfulness, our own mistakes, when we think of the great chasm that forms between us and God's perfection, and when we think that's impossible, through the death and resurrection of Christ, boom, we are reconnected with God. God is powerful. We are told to lean on Him, to be strong in His might. Did you catch that? It says, be strong in the Lord and in the strength of His might. It doesn't say Christian. Be strong in the Lord and try harder in your own power. Oh, I'm so thankful that it says that. In His might. It's His strength that gets us through. Stand strong. I remember uh, Jason and Rhonda Holtrop, we showed their video a couple weeks ago. They were expecting a, a baby daughter who had a very, very complicated pregnancy, very risky. And we prayed. We've been praying as a church. I've been talking with them on the phone. And if you've been reading their blog, you know that God is answering prayers. The miracles are happening. And they're talking to the physicians and the nurses about God. God is powerful. Lean on his might. So how do we stand strong? What does that look like? We're going to start today, and we're going to talk about putting on the full armor of God, standing strong. And then next week, we're going to break it down. What does that mean to put on the full armor of God? What are the different pieces of the armor? Verse 11 says to put on the whole armor of God. That underlined circle, whole. It says from head to toe, standing strong in God means full, complete protection. From head to toe, the whole armor of God. And like I said, next week we're going to break that apart and say, well, what does that look like in our everyday life? Put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the schemes of of the devil. <laughs> I love that word, schemes. You can stand on the schemes of the devil. The devil's plan, Satan's plans, uh, aren't always full-on attacks. Because we, we may recognize it then. But they're little tricks. Little ways to deceive us. Evil rarely looks like evil until it accomplishes its goal. It gains entrance by appearing attractive, desirable, and perfectly legitimate. It is a baited and camouflaged trap. Verse 12, For we do not wrestle against flesh and blood. We do not wrestle against flesh and blood. We do not wrestle with people. We do not wrestle with being too busy or not having enough money. We do not wrestle with other people's problems. We do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the cosmic powers over this present darkness, against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly places. That word spiritual is used here one time to talk about the uh, evil spiritual forces. Otherwise, uh, Elsewhere, everywhere else in the Bible, it's used to talk about good spiritual stuff. Uh, this time it's used to talk about spiritually evil stuff that's going on. It says, therefore, because we don't wrestle against the things of this world, but we are in this spiritual battlefield, take up the whole armor of God that you may be able to withstand in the day of evil, having done it all to stand firm. You see how many times the word stand is repeated in here? Verse 11, look to stand against the schemes of the devil. Do that verse 13, that you may be able to withstand in the evil day, and having done all to stand firm. If there's one thing to take away today, it's to stand strong, not in your strength, but in God's strength. There's a key principle of spiritual warfare in verse 12 that we, we often overlook. And that's that we don't wrestle against flesh and blood. We wrestle in a spiritual war zone. 
Your problem isn't people. Your problem is not physical, external issues. Those may be manifestations of what's going on, but the grand battle that's going on is a spiritual battle. The battles we have in this life are not fundamentally physical, but spiritual. This means that if you don't know how to navigate in the spiritual realm, you're in trouble. If you don't know how to navigate in the spiritual realm, the realm that all this stuff is, the, uh, the place that all this stuff is happening, where this war is taking place, if we don't know how to navigate the spiritual world, how in the world can we take care of the physical world? But a lot of times we don't think of it in these terms. We don't think of our Christian walk in these terms. We think if I try harder, if I do more, that I can fix things on my own. We don't realize that it's a potentially dangerous place, this spiritual journey. I was walking in Lake Chelan. It was day four of seven days, and I was on the the north end, like I said, and I was hiking along. I was pretty tired. I was pretty worn, but uh, oblivious to the dangers all around me. Uh, I was so weak and tired, I was oblivious to the cliff that dropped 20 feet to my left. I was hiking along this ridge. I was walking along and just kind of in a stupor, and just looking right down at my feet, and all of a sudden, I, I heard this noise that freaked me out and was a great call to the dangers all around me. I took one step and I heard and three or four feet away from me was a rattlesnake. And it freaked me out. I realized how dangerous that trail was. Satan is not happy when God is on the move. Now, God is more powerful, amen? We know how it ends. God wins in the end. But brothers and sisters, if you're facing discouragement, if you're facing despair, if you come here today completely weak before the Lord, don't try and do things on your own. Don't try and fix things on your own. Stand strong in the Lord. Stand strong. Imagine with me if we actually live this out, standing strong in the Lord, instead of trying to do things on our own. I imagine a husband sitting at his computer at night. The kids are upstairs asleep. His wife is on the laptop upstairs. He feels beat up at work. His kids act like they hate him. They're teenagers. I hear that happens from time to time. I imagine this husband sitting there, and all of a sudden this enticing thought runs through his head to look at porn on the internet. Thoughts like, well, every guy does it. It's not that big of a deal. And I imagine that man remembering Ephesians 6 to stand strong in God's power, in God's might. And as he cries out to God, he says, God, I can't do this. You've got to fix me. You've got to help me with this. He closes the internet browser window. He turns off the computer, and he runs upstairs to spend time with his wife. Where at one time he felt strong over time, and after confessing to other brothers and getting accountability on this, now he has great strength. I imagine a, another guy being stressed that he won't be able to provide for his family. Work has been tough. And that drive to provide that all men have is challenged. And he has an opportunity to advance at work. It would involve working really long hours, and maybe being dishonest at work. And he goes home and talks with his wife about the opportunity. <laughs> and he thinks about how he won't have to worry about paying his bills anymore, or if they're going to lose their house or not, or filling up the gas tank. 
And when Satan is whispering to him all the good benefits of taking this job, I imagine this man standing strong in God's strength, knowing that God will provide for his needs, knowing that he doesn't need to sacrifice integrity at the workplace, that God will provide for his family. And a decision that was at one time really hard to make now becomes crystal clear when he stands strong in the Lord. I think of a, a frustrated mom who just doesn't have anything go her way. Her voice feels like background noise with her kids. And she can't control angry outbursts and she lashes out at her kids but then feels guilty and struggles with this cycle of getting angry and feeling guilty and getting angry and feeling guilty and she spirals down into this significantly dark place. Instead of doing things on her own, I imagine her standing strong in the Lord, knowing that He's the one in control and that He can help her with her anger issues. And at one time when she would get angry over petty things, I imagine God transforming her life. Changing her into someone who's no longer controlled by rage. But somebody who's more confident, peaceful, in love. I imagine someone who is discouraged that things aren't going well. And let's face it, usually it's not one thing that goes poorly, right? I mean, usually there's not just one problem. Usually it's problem after problem after problem after problem after problem after problem after problem until we feel beat down by life. I feel someone discouraged, beat down by the tough stuff of life, if that's you here today, I want to encourage you to stand strong in the Lord. You feel weak because you are in a war zone. Stand strong in God's strength. Where do you feel weakest? Where do you feel the most tired? Where is Satan counter moving in your life right now? Stand strong in the Lord's might. 